Hello, my dear students and the rest of the learners. Welcome to this presentation in which we are going to continue with the discussion on the topic system development. This is part three of a four part series of presentations on this topic with the title of this presentation being the stages of system development with the focus on analysis, design and construction. My name is Memen JM, or you can simply call me Emily Swap. In this presentation, therefore, I will pay attention on the requirements specification or what we call system analysis. Then I'll look at system design and then system construction. These are usually stages three, four, and five in the system development life cycle. My dear students and the rest of the learners, for you to be able to gain understanding as to what system development life cycle is all about, I advise that you visit the YouTube channel by the name Emily Swap ICT and access part one as well as part two of this presentation. I will also look at what we call system testing, which is normally treated as part of system construction, which is stage five or phase five in the system development process. Let's now commence by looking at the requirement specification or what we call system analysis for the new system. This is the stage at which the analyst must come up with the detailed requirements for the new system, which include output specification, input specification, file or data stores, the hardware and software requirements. This section describes the features of the new system. This leads to full analysis of the current system and the consideration of users' requirements to be taken into account. The system specification is the detailed documentation for the new proposed system. Then documentation is going to be presented to the top management for approval and can assist other stakeholders to further evaluate the new system. The user's requirements are examined further in depth before finally designing the new system. The reason why the existing system is examined is to find the features that are still useful and can be retained in the new system. Let's now look at what we call the output specification. This is considering what is required from the system because the main interest from a system is purely information. So it is necessary to consider what is required from the system before deciding how to set about producing it. The analyst will need to consider form, the types, volumes, and the frequency of reports, as well as documents. 
the choice of output media will also have to be made, including when to use hand copy and when to use the screen displays. The output specification entails such activities as generation of reports used to facilitate decision making. The quality of system output, for example, reports, is also very important and it depends on how well the management and the user requirements are identified. Formatting of reports is equally important so that good quality reports are produced that are easy to understand. The following factors should be put into consideration when designing the output. Number one is the target audience. Various levels of management will require various details regarding the system. Number two is the frequency of report generation. This is because some reports are required at certain periods or randomly. Number three is the quality and format. This is because the quality and the format of information to be generated requires a certain format and to be of certain quality. And for that reason, the quality and format of information to be generated should be put into consideration. So the output requirements fall into three general categories. These are the hand copy, which includes reports, special forms amongst others. Then we have the soft copy, which is normally displayed on video screens. And we have computer usable output. For example, a computer file that has been created from the system that is used as input in another system. To define the requirements for output, the analyst carefully identifies the following. Number one is the purpose of the output. Number two are the elements of information that it will contain. Number three is the format of the output such as headings, data elements, the layout, amongst the others. Number four is how often and how fast the output will need to be produced. Let's now look at input specification. The input that is needed to obtain the relevant information that is the output from the system is identified once the analyst has identified the information requirement of the new computerized system. So consideration of input will be greatly influenced by the means of output. And therefore, consideration would be given to the data collection methods and validation, the types of input media available, the volumes of input documents, the design of input layout. So the input to the system is necessarily or is necessary because the contents of the input are used to maintain the master files. The following considerations should therefore be put in place, or the following should be considered in input specification. Number one 
is the contents and volume of input. Number two is the mode and the devices of input selected. Number three is the layout and the sequence of input. And then after identifying all the inputs, the analyst designs the user interface by designing data entry forms or screens. The user interface is an important determinant of whether the system will be happily accepted by the users or not. It must therefore be designed with a lot of care. So the input forms are identified along with all the controls required on those forms so as to display a good interface that is easy to use even by non-experts. The following guidelines should therefore be observed. Number one, the objects placed on the forms like text boxes, labels, and the command buttons must be neatly aligned and balanced on the form. Number two, the size of the form must not be too small for user legibility or too big to fit on the screen. Number three is the color for the interface, which must be chosen carefully in order to avoid hurting the eye. Always avoid the colors that are too bright. Let's now look at the file or data stores. File requirement specification involves making an informed decision on the files required to store data and information in the system. The system analyst should therefore identify the number of files that will be needed by the system and determines the structure of each of the files. The attributes of the records should also be identified. An attribute is a unique characteristic of a record for which a data value can be stored in the system database. It's only those attributes that are of importance to the system that are picked and used to store data for each record. The attributes form the basis for table design in the database. Each attribute becomes a field in the table. The file and database component elements are very much linked to input and output. Input is processed against the stored data in order to produce the necessary output. So, the considerations involved in deciding files are number one, storage media. Number two is the method of file organization and access. Number three is the file or database security. Number four is record or table layouts. The following are the factors that therefore you need to consider when designing a good file. Number one is the key attribute or field. This is an attribute that is unique for each record and it's normally referred to as the primary key. Number two is the type of data or data type. Each field as a data type. For example, text, date, among the others. Number three is the length of each field. This entails how long or small a field is in terms of the number of characters 
that it can hold. This is important because the longer the field, the slower the system takes to process transactions. Number four is backup and recovery strategies. This is storing the updated copies of data and information files in a different place other than the location of the current system in order to make sure that even if the current file gets corrupted or crashes, the backed up data can be used to recover or reconstruct the original file. In this section, the exact activities of the proposed system is thoroughly identified, including size, security, amongst the others. Number four is hardware and software requirements. The system analyst should specify all the hardware and software requirements for the new system. This involves buying the right hardware and software in order to achieve maximum benefits. So these two items depends on the availability of the finances. The following are therefore some of the factors to consider in hardware and software specification. Number one is the economic factors such as price and acquisition method. Number two are the operational factors. For example, reliability, upgradability and compatibility. Number three is user friendliness. In order to complete the system analysis stage, you must prepare system requirements document and make a presentation to the management. The system's requirements document entails number one, the requirements of the new system. It describes the alternatives that were considered and makes specific recommendations to the management. Number two, it is used for measuring the performance, accuracy, and the completeness of the finished system before entering the system design phase. It is the system blueprint that identifies what must be delivered by the system developers. Number three, it should be written in a language that users can understand so that they can offer input and suggest further improvements. The final version of the document must be approved by the users before the design phase is started. Number five is the processing requirements. These deal with the processing schedules. That is, when the data is input, when output is to be produced, and when files are to be updated, and the identification of logical and the computational processing activities. The requirements for computational and logical processing procedures are usually documented in narrative form or on graphic form or in a mathematical formula. If the processing logic is complex, the pseudocode, data flow diagrams, flowcharts, and other tools may be used. The fourth phase or stage is the system design. This involves in detailing the physical design of the system and its how the process will work. In other words, system design simply involves the analyst developing clear 
flow of processes or steps to be followed. Once the logical design is outlined during system analysis, the analyst determines the physical design, which describes the hardware, the software, and the operating system procedures required to make the system operational. I repeat that the system design involves in detailing the physical design of the system, and it simply indicates how processes will be undertaken. Once the logical design is outlined during system analysis, the analyst determines the physical design, which describes the hardware, the software, and the operating procedures that will be required in order to make the system operational. The analysis may lead to a number of possible alternative designs. Once one alternative has been selected, the purpose of the design stage is to work from the requirement specification in order to produce a system specification. The system specification will be a detailed set of documents that provides details of all features of the system. It serves two main purposes. These are number one, communication. It serves as a means of communicating all that is required to be known to all the interested parties. That is the management for financial approval, the programmers in order to enable them to write the programs necessary for implementation. The operating staff detailing all necessary operating procedures. The users, as they will ultimately be responsible for running the new system. The users must therefore be fully aware of the contents of the specification and their agreement is essential. Number two is records. A permanent record of the system in detail is necessary for control. It will be used for evaluations, modifications, and training records. Different persons require to know only parts of the whole specification. For example, programmers need to know the functions required and their layout, but will not need to know about the timings for data preparation or numbers of staff that is required. Some contents found in a typical system specification include, number one, detailed specification of all the files, that is database concepts or components together with the specimens layout. The screen layouts and dialog designs with the specimen copies of each. Number two is the program specification. It entails or indicates the details of screens, inputs, the outputs and the processes for each program runs. Test data and the expected results. The stop and the start, file checking and error checking procedures. It also includes controls, as well as the relationship between procedures and the computer runs for bunch programs. Number three is implementation procedures. These include detailed timetable, using networks or other scientific aids. The details of conversion procedures, the changeover procedures 
including systems checking. Number four is equipment. It indicates all equipment, including backup equipment and its maintenance arrangements. Number five is user department instructions. This related to the input to the system, that is times for forwarding source documents. The output from the system that is dealing with documents and the control totals amongst the others. Therefore, the system specification gives a detailed set of steps to be followed during the system design. Some tools used for designing an information system are flow charts, data flow charts, the data flow diagrams, the entity relationships models, structured charts. These tools depict the flow of information throughout the system. Let's look at the system flowcharts. A system flowchart shows the general flow of information and it's a tool for analyzing processes that allows one to break down a process into individual events or activities and to display this in shorthand form showing the sequential or logical relationships between them. The system flowchart is a pictorial representation of the functionality of a new system. Therefore, it must have clear flow of information with every step clearly defined as to what it does so that even new employees would make use of it easily in the maintenance of the system. After drawing the system flowchart, other algorithm design tools are used to extract the processing logic for each module in the system before system construction. From system flowchart, a program flowchart for each task can then be extracted. The system flowchart has many similarities to the program flowchart, but it has its own set of symbols and it seeks to depict the whole system rather than the individual program modules. Some common system flowchart symbols are, number one, rectangle with rounded corners. It represents an event which occurs automatically and usually triggers a chain of other events. The other one is kite. A kite represents the sort of operation to be done. In other words, a kite represents the sort operation. Then we have the start stroke stop activity symbol. The other is offline file symbol. We have the flow direction symbol and we have what we call the on-page connector. Then we have the symbol for computerized process, data input device or a keyboard symbol. The manual process symbol, decision symbol, the off page connector, and the monitor screen or CRT symbol. Then we have the report or document symbol, the disk master file symbol, the disk transaction file symbol, the table file as well as physical flow of goons symbol. How now do you design a system flowchart? A system flowchart 
gives a concise picture of the way particular processes are done within the business organization. After this has been achieved, the next logical step of making changes to the processes for the better can be handled easily. So, some of the guidelines for designing a system flowchart include, number one, always start by writing the title of the flowchart. Then if possible, start drawing the flowchart with a trigger event. Then note down the successive actions taken in their logical order until the event or process is concluded. Always use few ones to describe the actions. Number four, when there are many alternatives at the decision stage, follow the most important and continue with it. Other significant but less important alternatives can be drawn elsewhere and reference meant to them by using the on or off page connectors. Let's look at data flow diagrams on DFDs. This is a program that provides an infective form in which it represents movements of data through a system and the associated transactions of the data resulting from various processing actions taken upon it. The data flowcharts can be used for clarification in any phase of the system development life cycle. The views that data flow diagrams provide are free of unnecessary details and are therefore very useful in providing an overview of the system. The process flow is not represented on a data flow diagram although it can sometimes be deducted from the data flow. The following are some of the DFD symbols that are used. The first one is a source or a destination of data symbol which is external to the system. In other words, this first symbol indicates a source or a destination of data which is external to the system. The next symbol is for a process. It indicates that the flow of data is transformed, or in other words, a process indicates data transformation process. For example, processing an order or checking credit status. Then we have a data store symbol. It indicates any stored data, but with no reference to the physical method of storage. Then we have a data flow symbol, which is normally an arrow. The next one is context diagrams, which is number three. This is a top level, also known as level zero, data flow diagram. It only contains one process load, that is process zero, that generalizes the function of the entire system in relationship to external entities. For example, we have this diagram here with the first level DFD showing the main processes within the system. And each of these processes can be broken into further processes until you reach the pseudocode. Let's now look at the EAR models, 
or what we call the entity attributes and relationship models. The basic elements of an EAR model are entities, attributes, and relationships. Its modeling constructs are as follows. Number one is entity. This is anything about which data can be stored. For example, if a system needs to store data about the customers or products, then the model would have customer or product entities. Number two is attributes. The attributes of an entity are those facts that need to be stored about the entity. For example, the attributes of a customer might include the account number, the name, address, and the credit limit. Number three is relationships. These exist between various entities within a system. For example, there may be a relationship between the customer and an order. They are represented by lines between entities. The bands fit at the end of the arrows are used to show the degree of the relationship. The following is therefore an example of an EAR model of an ordering system. So from this diagram, we can see that we have entities which are represented as rectangles. The attributes are listed beside the entities. For example, customer entity has account number, account name, and address entities, where relationships are represented by lines between entities. So from this diagram, we can see that we have a customer who has an account number, a name, and an address. And this customer places an order. And this customer order contains or includes the order number, the account number, and the date. And this customer order includes details such as the order number, the product code, and the number required. And finally, we have what is ordered. That is the product. And it has details or attributes such as product code, product, and description. So simply, when we are using this tool in our design, we must always ensure that we represent entities as rectangles. Then we list each entity's attributes beside that entity, and we should indicate clearly the relationships between the entities So the two main objectives of the design phase are, number one is to design the new system. Number two is to establish a sound framework of controls with which the new system should operate. The design phase can be broken down into two parts. That is the preliminary design and the detailed design. The preliminary design is a rough draft that describes the functional capabilities of the proposed information system. It's called the logical design. 
It is a review of system requirements considering all the major components of the system. In this stage, you consider several alternative systems while evaluating the cost and the benefits of each. Number two is detailed design. It, it's also called a physical design. It describes how a proposed system will deliver the general capabilities described in the preliminary design. At this stage, you consider the input, processing, output, and storage requirements. The computer and software engineering case tools may be used to document the design. The case tools provide the computer automated support for structure and design techniques. They speed up the design process and improve the quality of systems development and documentation. The case tools can generate graphic tools such as the DFDs, the flowcharts, structure charts, and data models. Number two are reports on file contents, properties of data elements, and the rules of logic. Number three is prototypes. Number four is quality analysis reports. Number five is the programming code of writing software programs. Number six is project management tools. Number seven is the cost versus benefit analysis. The completion of the design phase of the system development life cycle is therefore marked by three events. These three events are number one, the analyst completes, organizes, and assembles the new system design documentation, including records of the general and application controls. This documentation should include a complete overview of the new system as a whole, a description or a narrative or on graphics of the major processing modules into which the system has been divided for design purposes. It should also include detailed documentation describing the input, processing, and output activities in each module and submodule. In addition, it should also include specification of the storage requirements for the new system and description of each file to be maintained in the system, including anticipated size and organization scheme or access method to be used. In addition, it should have a narrative description of the general and application controls to be used within the new system. Number two, the system analyst and information processing management need to review the technical soundness of the design. Number three, the system analyst, user management and information processing management need to present and review the design so as to come up with a decision either to improve the design and proceed to the next phase of system development life cycle or to revise the design before continuing. The next phase is called the system construction. This is the process of developing, that is coding and installation and testing a functional system that fulfills the business and design requirements. The modules and their components, such as outputs, inputs, and the files, are developed 
and tested. So it is at this stage where the building of the new system begins following the document produced in the system design stage. The system analysts, programmers, and the computer operators come together to build the new system where each has a certain role to play, and so on. In the system construction stage of system development life cycle, the system design serves as the blueprint for constructing the new system. The programmers can come up at this stage to construct a computerized working model of the same. The information systems department plans, develops documents, integrates and tests all new programs and the code modules. Therefore, at this stage, programmers and analysts assume different responsibilities. An analyst must deliver a clear, accurate set of specifications to the programmer. A programmer then calls, tests, and documents the individual program modules which or modules while the system analyst plans the integration of programs and assures that they work together to meet business requirements. The coding using one or some of the following programming languages, such as C++, Java, Visual Basic, among others, testing and system installation all take place in this phase. Some system construction methods include, number one, using the high level structure and languages such as Pascal, COBOL, amongst others. Number two, using fourth generation languages, for example, Visual Basic, Visual COBOL, Delphi Pascal, amongst others. Number three is customizing the standard package, for example, a database software like Access, financial package, or enterprise management system. The analyst role during the application development does not cover programming skills, techniques, or activities. During application development, analysts determine the overall design strategy and work with the programmers to complete the design, coding, testing, and documentation of all programs, modules, and macros. They also prepare operations and use some documentation or manuals. A new system requires planning, construction, and testing. After establishing a strategy, programs and modules are designed, coded, tested, and documented. After developing the programs and the code modules, the systems analysts and the programmers perform link testing of modules, system testing, and the complete all documentation. Coding, in this context, is the process of turning program logic into specific instructions that can be executed by the computer system. So what is system testing or what does it entail? Testing is done using sample data based on the specification of the new system. It's always important to test the system before implementation in order to ensure that the individual programs have been written correctly and that the system as a whole works as expected. After construction, the system is therefore tested by entering some test data in order to find out whether its outputs 
are as expected. The system is tested using the requirements specifications and the design specifications in order to find out whether it meets all requirements specified. Unit testing, on the other hand, is the testing of an individual program or a module. The objective is to identify and eliminate execution errors that cause the program to terminate abnormally and logic errors that might have been missed during the desk checking. Link testing is necessary for programs or modules that depend on each other. It is important to ensure that all the modules communicate with each other as designed. System testing is therefore the final testing of the entire system in order to make sure that it works as per the design and involves both the users and the developers. Thereafter, the new system is installed and further testing is carried out to make sure that there are no errors and the system works as specified. The test data used, used must be kept for future reference should the organization or business policies change. Some software alternatives that can be selected at this stage include, number one, in-house system. This is software that is developed by the company's own information system development. Number two is off the shelf. This is the software that is purchased and or released from a software developer. The software developers are companies that specialize in developing software applications for sale. Number three is customization. If no commercially available software package satisfies the user requirements and the organization is not in a position to develop in-house, then the existing software package that meets a large proportion of the requirements can be customized in order to meet all the specifications. Number four is outsourcing. This is the use of an outside company to handle the information system functions of the organization on either temporary or long-term basis. Number five is end user systems. The applications that can be operated and managed by end users on their own. For example, Microsoft Office. Number six is enterprise computing. An overall information management strategy that supports the group, department, and the total company information needs, usually based on the client server architecture. So, assuming the software provides the required functionality, there are four key attributes that a well-developed system must support. These are, number one, the software should be maintainable. During the lifetime of a software product, it will be subject to change. It should therefore be written and documented so that the changes can be made cost effectively. Number two is that the software should be reliable and meet the user's requirements. So there should be no or minimal bugs in the program that may cause it to malfunction. Number three is the software should be efficient. 
Efficiency in this context means that a system should not make wasteful use of resources such as memory and the processor. Number four, the software should offer a user-friendly interface. This is because software may not be used to its full potential due to lack of good interface that is simple to use. And therefore, software may not be used to its full potential because its interface makes it difficult to use. And with that, we have come to the end of the presentation on part three. Congratulations for learning part three of four on system development. You can access part one, part two, and part four of this series of presentations and the other computer or ICT videos by clicking or tapping on Emily Swap ICT YouTube channel below this video. You can also subscribe to this channel by tapping on subscribe button below this video if it's not currently reading as subscribed. You can also visit and subscribe to Emily Swap Life Skills YouTube channel for free life skills, motivational and inspirational resources. For any further correspondence, kindly write it to us through the email mlswap at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening to me and God bless.